Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and good morning to um, our colleagues and friends up in the north, um, in Europe, and also elsewhere. Um, and welcome to our webinar on the launch of the special issue of the Asian Journal of Law and Society on Presidential Regulation Number 125 of 2016. My name is Ravi Marinas, um, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I uh, would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Let me now uh, give you a quick rundown of the program. Um, uh, we have a number of speakers for today, and each presenter will have eight minutes to deliver their paper. The first part of our program will be an introduction to the special issue, which will be given by Professor Susan Niebohm from Melbourne Law School. Um, if Tim is there, um, I'd like to call on Tim just to give us a quick uh, welcome uh, to Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome. Kalau di Jakarta atau di Indonesia, selamat siang. Di sini selamat sore dan selamat datang. My name is Tim Lindsay. I'm director of the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society here in Melbourne Law School. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting this event tonight, the launch of this special issue of the Asian Journal of Law and Society on presidential regulation 125 of 2016 on the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers in Indonesia. Like Revi, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which our law school stands. And uh, we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would like to congratulate everybody involved in this important event for three reasons. First, because in these difficult times, COVID-19 and other problems have pushed the plight of refugees off the front pages of our newspapers. And that includes the plight of refugees trapped in limbo in Indonesia, but their rights and their futures deserve better than that. And this special issue is a very timely reminder of that. Second, congratulations are deserved because many of the findings presented in this special issue draw on extensive empirical research in Indonesia and they thus convey the voices of those involved, refugees and policymakers. And that is of real importance to anyone seeking to understand what is going on. Third, it is wonderful to see Indonesian scholars published in English in a leading international journal, the Asian Journal of Law and Society. I know this sort of international publication is very important for Indonesian scholars and their careers, and also that it can be very hard to achieve, even though their work is often of the first quality. So I, I congratulate Professor Susan Kneebone and, and the editors for making this possible for so many Indonesian scholars. So, Finally, thank you very much to everybody attending. Um, I think we have about 31 people online at the moment, some more to come. Thank you all for attending this event and for supporting research on refugees and asylum seekers. I'll now hand over back or hand back to our moderator for the next hour and a half, Dr. Rebi Marinas, who I should say is an immigration lawyer as well as a research fellow here in Melbourne Law School. So thank you, Rebi. Thank you, Tim. Um, as I said before, uh, the first part of our program will be an introduction uh, to the special issue, which will be given by Professor Susan Nibon from the Melbourne Law School. Um, the second part of the program will be for presentations on opportunities and challenges that the presidential regulation provides for the advancement of refugee protection in Indonesia. In the second part, our first presenter is uh, Mahadika uh, Samso Oed Sajad from the International Institute of Social Studies at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Her paper is entitled, What Are Refugees Represented to Be? A Frame Analysis of the Presidential Regulation 
number 125 of 2016 concerning the treatment of refugees from abroad. After Mahadika's presentation, our next presenter will be uh, Imadi Budi Arsika from the Faculty of Law, Udayana University, Indonesia. And he'll be presenting on the assessment of the responsibility of local governments in Indonesia for the management of refugee care. Budi's presentation will then be followed by Professor Anche Misbach from Bielefeld University in Germany who will be presenting on the role of local governments in accommodating refugees in Indonesia, investigating best and worst case scenarios. And our final presenters will be jointly presented by Bilal Diwansha from Leiden University in the Netherlands and Ratu Duratun Nafisa from the Melbourne Law School. Their paper is about the constitutional right to asylum and humanitarianism in Indonesia, foreign refugees and Presidential Regulation number 125 of 2016. And the third and final part of our program will be commentaries from Max Walden from Melbourne Law School and Dr. Nick Tan from the Danish Institute of Human Rights in Denmark. Max's presentation will be a commentary on the politics of refugee protection in Indonesia. And Dr. Nick Tan's presentation will be a commentary on opportunities and challenges of the presidential regulation. After all the presentations, we'll be having a 20 minutes question and answer portion. So there will be opportunities for questions and further discussions around this topic. So without any further ado, I now pass on the screen to Professor Susan Nebone to provide us with an introduction to the special issue. Thank you very much for those introductions, Tim and Ravi. We have called this introduction the false promise of presidential regulation. And so I'm presenting in the next few minutes the introduction to the special issue, which is being co-written by myself with Anche Misbach and, and uh, Balawin or Winnie Jones. The whole publication arises from an ARC project, which is entitled Indonesia's Refugee Policies, Responsibility, Security and Regionalism. And this production, this publication is in response to the issue of responsibility. In Indonesia, we have 14,000 refugees or asylum seekers stranded without rights to work, education, housing or integration. They have exercised a fundamental right to seek asylum in international law. And so the whole situation is in fact collateral damage of Australia's policies. Uh, Australia and Indonesia have a, a long standing relationship in relation to refugees. Uh, Australia's policies based on deterrence uh, and in 2014, Australia ceased without very little warning, the practice of resettling refugees from Indonesia. That's not what we're debating today. What we're looking at, in fact, is the issue of Indonesia's responsibilities. And Indonesia has been chosen uh, for, for, for the focus of this ARC project uh, for very special reasons, as, as I will explain. Uh, but I'd point out that this 14,000 or bigger is much less than countries such as Thailand and Malaysia, with which Indonesia has joined in some recent initiatives. And um, that's one of the points of uh, this, this project. So these, here, here are some pictures to show you what the lived experiences of some sectors of the refugee population are in Indonesia. So the question of responsibility is one that's very important in the context of Southeast Asia, which is known as the region which has rejected the idea of refugee protection. Um, uh, and, but the situation is quite complex because IOM and UNHCR also have important roles under a regional cooperation arrangement with uh, Indonesia, which I have written about a piece of blatant self advertisement here, but and others also have written about it. So one of the upshots of this situation under which IOM basically is provided with funding mainly from the Australian government to manage refugees and UNHCR to process and, and care and advocate for refugees is that refugees have enhanced expectations about UNHCR's role um, as this, this, this 
sort of picture um, su suggests. Uh, and so in this picture, can the Indonesian government simply step away from the situation? The answer is quite simple in my view, it is no. Um, and, and this is an interesting story, a story which we're presenting as a story about policy making and law, uh, but based very much on a lot of empirical uh, research with, with policy makers as well as refugee populations. So the story in brief is that Indonesia has a constitutional right to asylum and the ability to create laws for re refugee protection, but the presidential re uh, regulation of 2016 has not met those expectations. So we call it a false promise in that whilst um, the presidential regulation has an expanded definition of refugee, which more or less mirrors the definition in the Refugee Convention and enables it to grant temporary protection to asylum seekers, who are normally not recognized as having a status in a state before they're processed as refugees, it has further, at the same time, further decentralized state responsibility and given little by way of right to refugees as the speakers in this uh, edition will show. So that is why the focus of this special edition is on the responsibility of the Indonesian government to protect um, refugees. Uh, and a litmus test of the effect of the presidential regulation was in the 2014 flight of Rohingya persons, uh, uh, many of whom were turned away first by Thailand, Malaysia, and also Indonesia. The, the presidential regulation basically made no difference to the situation. The, Publication also arises, is based on a workshop that was held in Jakarta in 2019, which was sponsored by Silas, who's sponsoring the current uh, seminar, and the Faculty of Law, and one of the co-investigators under the project, Dr. Heru Susetio. The importance of this special edition is that the articles critically assess the contribution of the presidential regulation to the advancement of refugee rights in law and policies and discusses and, and discuss the challenges and opportunities. As a non-signatory to the Refugee Convention, but party to major human rights instruments, Indonesia is bound by non-reformant obligations. Uh, and that's something which we can't forget. So this special issue highlights what I call the fault lines in developing protection responses in a post-colonial context. So as you can see, it is a, a publication on, on socio-legal approaches, but also we bring in political analyses as well, very much into this situation. So these are the fault lines, as I call them. They fall under two headings. We have, on the one hand, uh, a, a, the ability to take a, a rights-based approach in Indonesia. There is a constitutional right to asylum. There, there is a law. Uh, the story is, is quite complicated and I won't go into detail, but, but, but basically there is the constitutional right to asylum. There are laws which enable the Indonesian government to enact laws to, to implement uh, processes for determining refugee status. There are rights to human rights in its constitution. Uh, basically, there is the ability for state-centered responses to be implemented. Uh, and the because of the nature of the fundamental right to seek asylum uh, in international law, we can say that this is something which is a sovereign right of the state, a sovereign privilege of the state and something which the Indonesian state should do. But instead what we will see, uh, and what we'll also see some of, some of our authors arguing for is something which is quite different. Uh, uh, there is an immigration law, for example, which is much more favoured by policymakers, as many of the comments at the workshop showed us, um, a securitised approach. Uh, there is also a preference for a humanitarian discretionary approach, which mirrors that of other states such as Thailand and Malaysia in Southeast Asia, which is really a way of saying, let's forget about the law, 
this is an immigration matter. We have the sovereign right to determine who comes to our country. Perhaps those words are familiar. And so that is the approach that is used. But furthermore, under the presidential regulation, as, a, as our speakers will explain, the state has moved away from state-centered responses. It has instead replaced them with local or regional and decentralized um, responses. Uh, and it has furthermore, as we've seen, further delegated responsibility to the UNHCR. So that is what our special issue is about, exposing these fault rights through a set of, of, of papers from very talented Indonesian scholars. So uh, without saying anything more, and apologies again for my very fluffy, unprofessional beginning, I'll hand over to further speakers. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Susan. Our next speaker is uh, Mahar Dika. You ready with your uh, PowerPoint, Dika? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present my paper titled um, what are refugees represented to be a frame analysis of the presidential regulation 125 2016 in Indonesia? My, uh, my paper is an application of Bachi's what's the problem represented to be or the WPR approach to unpack how refugees were represented in the regulation. Um, Treating policy as discourse, I moved away from the traditional practice of evaluating the effectiveness of a policy and instead investigated how the presidential regulation portrays refugees and other relevant actors and frames the problem it wants to address. The purpose here is to recognize that the way in which problems are framed is not innocent and to make explicit the assumptions embedded in the presidential regulation that inform and affect the treatment of refugees in Indonesia. The task in a WPR, as uh, Bachi says, is to, um, to read policies in an eye to discerning how the problem is represented within them and to subject this problem representation to critical scrutiny. And to do this, um, I applied a text analysis of the presidential regulation, comparisons with earlier drafts of the, of the regulation and my own field work in 2018 to 2019. I won't be able to go through all my findings, but I've uh, picked in two to focus on. And the first is the definition uh, uh, that finally recognizes refugee status in the country. When you, as you can see from the definition on this slide, uh, the definition of refugees under the presidential regulation is largely consistent to the 1951 convention. There are slight variations. Uh, one of which I highlighted in red, and it says, and or has obtained asylum seeker status or refugee status from the United Nations um, in its definition of what is a refugee. This means that refugee and asylum seeker categories are not necessarily seen as separate. And according to the presidential regulation, an individual is recognized as a refugee because they meet the definition and not necessarily because they receive asylum seeker or refugee status from the UNHCR, um, as we can see from this conjunction and or. So in this case, the presidential regulation does add space uh, to further validate uh, refugees' presence and space for advocacy to UNHCR and other um, civil society organizations. However, there is a very apparent absence of a human rights discourse within this regulation. Um, it is not even, human rights is not even mentioned once in the regulation. Even when, for example, detailing the technical standards for refugees shelters, it does not really frame these shelters as rights that refugees are entitled to. For example, in chapter three on shelter or penampungan, the presidential regulation sets a standard to be met uh, by regency and municipality governments when deciding on a refugee's location for shelter or accommodation, but it does not on the first half, it doesn't impose an obligation to actually provide these shelters to begin with. And this is and this is quite obvious in the use of the um, 
um, auxiliary, sorry, I don't know if I'm saying it right, the auxiliary verb dapat or may, uh, which is very intentional because rather than, for example, using the word must, harus, it emphasizes that governments and actors may do something, may provide shelter, may provide facilities for refugees. And as such, um, it, it puts into writing what may be done without necessarily uh, guaranteeing something must be done for refugees. Um, and so that, I think that is very contrast from earlier drafts of this uh, regulation. If we look at earlier drafts from 2011, um, there was a paragraph called principles. And in that paragraph, uh, there was a commitment not to deport, not to prosecute and ensure same treatment to refugees. And also in that, in, in a later draft in December, 2011, there was also an explicit respect, uh, an explicitly stated uh, um, respect uh, for asylum seekers and refugees' rights. Um, the, these principles were not available in the in the uh, in, you know in the final version of the presidential regulation. And I think what my paper tries to um, address and what my presentation just wants to briefly demonstrate is that paying attention to what uh, governments include and ex exclude in their political agenda sheds light in the ways in which terms of the discourse limit what can be discussed as a possible what is possible and what is desirable or what is impossible and undesirable the exclusion of human rights discourse from the presidential regulation is even more problematic considering its framing of refugees as potential threats to security, which is also something I discussed in my paper, but will not have time to discuss here. So just as a last slide, um, I think what is clear from a very detailed text analysis of the presidential regulation is that refugees and asylum seekers in Indonesia is still seen as transitory. So it's a temporary crisis with potential security risks. Um, and what is silence? What is not said? It doesn't talk about human rights nor protection. It has a language of emergency, uh, emergent, a language of crisis. Um, it offers the, the pot potentiality of localized shelters, but does not mention, for example, uh, the fact that a third of refugees in Indonesia are non-funded independent refugees. And it doesn't include in the discussion of durable solution an option for local integration or local inclusion. So it is really much uh, written with the expectations that at what point refugees will leave the country. So in, in um, and I think what's also important to remember, this was a draft written in 2016 when IOM still had a commitment or the, and the capacity to, uh, to accommodate and facil facilitate most refugees in Indonesia. And they've stopped actually adding new caseload, um, new, new beneficiaries to their caseload since mid 2018. So, so I think it's important to see how, uh, whether or not this um, presidential regulation is also uh, keeping updated to the present social economic conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dika, that was um, very comprehensive. Um, our next speaker is uh, Budi. Budi, if you're ready, it's um, it's over to you. Yes, because we only have uh, eight minutes, yeah. So I uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Refi, yeah, and all the organizer as well as the panelists and attendees of this um, webinar. Um, allow me to represent the group of the five authors and co-authors. Uh, the first author is Inyoman Syatna, me, myself, Nigusti Ayudhya Satyawati. The three of us are from uh, Udayana University Faculty of Law, Bali. And we have also Associate Professor Rohainan, Rohaida Nordin from uh, Faculty of Law, um, uh, Universitas Kebangsaan Malaysia. And we have also Balawin Jones uh, from Melbourne University Law School, uh, University of Melbourne. The title of our um, article, the paper, is the assessment of the responsibility of local governments in Indonesia for the management of refugee care. Yeah. Yeah. And with regard to the aim and method, our research assesses the responsibility of local government in Indonesia with regard to this uh, refugee care handling yeah, following the creations of the presidential regulations on the treatment of refugees. Yeah, uh, the paper in our special issue 
uh, is fo focused on the constraints of the local politics dynamics and budgeting in allocating local government funds for the handling of refugee. The primary analysis is based on the statutory approach. It means uh, we read some relevant Indonesian law, regulation, administrative decrees, and technical policies guidelines related to the issue we discuss. Um, besides, we conducted uh, what so called as a field research in the province of Kepulauan Riau in August 2018. There are uh, at least five key findings in our paper. First of all, there has been a gradual shifting in the handling of refugee care and service provisions from the national government level to the regional or local government level. It is what's so called as the decentralization. Yeah, we all know that uh, previously uh, it is merely only the national government issue. Yeah, especially on the foreign relation as well as uh, immigration uh, offices. And uh, we found that the authority of local governments for the handling of refugees uh, come from at least four uh, legal regimes. Yeah, it includes the foreign relations legal regime, human rights legal regimes, immigration legal regimes, as well as local government regimes. From the structures, I mean from the institutions at the national level, the Indonesian Coordinating Ministry for Politic, Legal and Security Affairs plays a key part in coordinating the different legal regimes, as well as the institutions that implement the PR. The four key findings that um, we observe that the national legal policies that justify the local government involvement in the refugee issues are actually well developed. However, what we have seen in the practice, as far as this research concerns, the shift in responsibilities for refugee care and service provision has not significantly progressed. Also, we observe that there has been obvious hesitance from local governments to adopt such a role due to issues including local budget constraints or fundings, a lack of economic support from the national government and weak political will to implement the presidential regulations, especially with respect to the provisions of adequate community housing and suffer. The One of the main legal issues we found is that the abstentions of the local regulations as the legitimations for uh, local apparatus to allocate such budget is the, the main issue. Um, we, we try to propose, I mean, what is the upcoming situation and what is the next step to be taken by the government, mainly the national government. Uh, we propose two issues. Number one, uh, the first issue is to we uh, we urge the national government, especially the president of the Republic of Indonesia, to amend the presidential regulations. And the second proposal of our uh, paper is about the the needs to establish the local implementing regulations. With regards to the first uh, proposal, I mean how to amend the PR, and I mean what issues should be amended in the PR, uh, we uh, propose there are two issues. Number one, there is a loophole in the PR regarding the governor authority. As far as we read the, uh, the PR, uh, there is no one words or sentence that include the nomenclature of governor or the provincial government. In fact, uh, uh, we we can find uh, in the some uh, resources that there are at least uh, three uh, provinces in Indonesia that uh, uh, have a concerns on the on the uh, on the refugees issues, and of course, I mean the president regulation only mentions the authority of the municipality and also the regencies uh, government. I mean at the Sorry, I mean at the only mentions about at the local level, not at the provincial level. And the second proposal for amending the PR is the Article 40. Uh, we propose the extensions of the sources of funding under Article 40 of the PR 
the Article 40 mentions that there are two source of funding. Number one is the national revenue and uh, expenditure budget uh, through relevant ministry and institutions. And the second one is other legitimate sources. There is no specific uh, 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 provisions or words that mentioning the, the regional or local revenue and expenditure budget. And with regard to the establishment of local implementing regulations, uh, we think uh, there is a need to create a local implementing agency and the clear avenues for finding within the local regulations. And also, um, we think it will be good if there is uh, such a financial intensive or grant schemes for regency and municipality government from the national government. To conclude this very short uh, presentations, uh, we uh, we submit that there is still a concerns, yeah, with regards to the implementation of the relevant law and policy at the lowest level of administrations in this regard, the local government. Uh, the second concluding remarks, um, we conclude that there is a lack of political will that is combined with limited resources at the local government raise the need to amend the presidential regulations to clarify regional authority to handle refugee care, as well as to establish clear local regulation for implementation, for implementing the presidential regulation. Lastly, we take, uh, con we take account into the current global and global national and local financial constraints during and after the pandemic that might have a serious impact to the handling of refugee care at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Budi. Um, our next panelist is uh, Professor Anche Misbach. I'll share your screen, Anche. Just give me a sec. Very much appreciated, Ravi. Okay. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening uh, to you all. Um, I will be walking you through uh, our paper and the title of that paper is the role of the local governments um, in accommodating refugees in Indonesia. It's a comparative study of two uh, cities and it's a paper that was co-written with Yunisa Atiputra, who unfortunately can't join us today because he's currently conducting his uh, PhD in Florida. So his time zone uh, is basically out of, of the possible, but he sends his regards um, and Yunisa and I, we have been writing a couple of uh, papers together in the past, and we have primarily concentrated uh, on the city of uh, Makassar. So that was one of the reasons why we chose um, Makassar to be a, a case study uh, when looking at how um, asylum seekers and refugees are actually accommodated uh, under the pair press, because there has been an interesting um, shift um, that asylum seekers and refugees no longer need to be held in immigration detention centers, which is a good development. However, um, in some cases, it has remained unclear where to house them um, uh, in those cases. So, um, so building on our previous work in, in Makassar, um, we also decided to look at uh, Jakarta. Uh, and the reason for this is um, that uh, it's probably easier to, to assess uh, developments in Jakarta, even from afar, but also in terms of relevance, Jakarta is very important because the largest uh, numbers of asylum seekers and refugees actually live there. So we are interested in looking at the obligations, um, how um, alternative accommodation, um, so non-customary um, shelters have been um, set in, uh, in, in reality. Um, and since local governments have become part of the refugee management in Indonesia, um, it um, became very early quite clear to us that each city seems to have adopted rather different approaches when it comes to taking care of asylum seekers and refugees. So there are massive uh, differences between the cities. And it would have been lovely to look at more places such as Medan or Pekanbaru, but this was uh, basically outside um, of what we were able to do. So. A brief look at Makassar. So Makassar has always enjoyed a very favorable reputation amongst refugees. Um, in fact, some uh, came there uh, themselves um, because they adhered a local authorities treaty asylum seekers and refugees nicely. Um, this 
favorable reputation in a way um, became a problem to the local government because they thought they can't uh, handle more than 2,000 refugees. Uh, so they decided to appeal to the national government to cap the numbers and no longer refer more asylum seekers and refugees to Makassar. Now, the interesting thing for Makassar is that even before the papers was uh, enforced, there were actually a lot of alternatives to detention or community shelters already in place. So Makassar, in a way, has been this piloting uh, project of uh, trying out um, non-customary um, accommodation. So, and that, of course, was also a reason why a lot of asylum seekers and refugees would come to Makassar rather than staying in other places if they had a choice to do so. So with the um, implementation of the uh, PR, basically, there hasn't really changed much. Um, it has only formalized some of the existing practices um, that were already um, in Makassar. Um, so at first sight, Makassar might uh, appear like a, a sanctuary city almost because they have um, this more humane uh, approach um, with the community shelters. However, we did notice quite a few differences with the implementation of the PR. And this was that uh, life in those shelters became more and more restrictive. So whereas asylum seekers refugees used to be uh, rather free to come and go, uh, suddenly with the PR, uh, curfews were introduced. There were more guards, guards in uniforms. And I'm not sure whether you can see it at this uh, picture here but like um, the bottom the crown floor became concealed so nobody can look inside the compound but actually people also can't look outside and um, um, under this underneath this black uh, cover it's becoming incredibly hot so there was a lot of um, small changes like this um, that in a way made us think that uh, even though there was uh, no more immigration detention, no more mandatory immigration detention, that some of the shelters started to look in, uh, increasingly more like um, yeah, comp uh, compounds for the detainment because like uh, everyday movements were becoming more restricted. Um, and that, of course, um, has also led to some protests um, at the side of the, the uh, refugees. So while we were in Makassar, we actually did get to see some of those um, rallies that were organized in front of the IOM office in the uh, Makassar downtown. And, and people were to express uh, their frustrations, not just with the living conditions, um, but of course they were also um, demanding faster resettlement uh, or processing of their cases. Um, and in some cases they were also protesting the harsh treatment uh, of refugees by immigration officials. So. Uh, while in the past um, it was often the civilian uh, government that was uh, in charge uh, of uh, dealing with asylum seekers and refugees, we did notice um, a strong shift uh, to immigration officials. Um, and they often, for example, would arrest protesters, just a handful, to teach everybody else who had participated in the protest a lesson. So there were a lot of these disciplinary measures that often meant that asylum seekers and refugees were re-detained in the immigration detention center, the place of course continued um, to exist, just um, to discipline um, all the other asylum seekers and refugees present in the city. And under the pair press, there's actually quite a lot of discretion at the hands of the, the local immigration authorities of what they can do and what they, uh, yeah, what they can do basically. So, and, and, and in that case, we noticed that they really uh, made use of this decretion. Um, next picture, please. Um, so here you basically see uh, one of the rallies that uh, took place in Makassar. And now we're gonna switch uh, to Jakarta. So uh, at the time of our field work in March, 2019, there were about 1,670 refugees under the supervision of the immigration detention center in Calideras. Um, so in a way, um, this cohort made um, Jakarta the, the third largest uh, after Medan and Makassar. But on top of those people who uh, were registered um, by the immigration detention center, um, there was quite a large number of so-called um, autonomous uh, refugees. Um, and their numbers were estimated at at least 5,000 uh, by the local authorities. Um, and the big difference is while everybody in um, 
Makasa, almost everybody was under the care of IOM and therefore was provided with some housing in the form of community shelters. Uh, the majority of refugees in Indonesia did not receive any of that care. And that um, caused a lot of um, homelessness and, and destitution. And you can see a picture here where people basically were sleeping uh, rough in front of the uh, immigration detention center to in order to alert to their uh, desperate um, situation. So um, we, we didn't find this kind of homelessness in, to the same extent uh, amongst refugees and asylum seekers in, in Makassar as we did encounter in, in, in Jakarta. Um, we did talk um, quite substantially um, uh, with local authorities in, in Jakarta, uh, both from the provincial but also from the level of the municipality. And while conducting these talks, um, we had the impression there was really no urgency amongst these officials um, to do something. Um, they, they were in a way a bit too relaxed. They were saying they were looking into um, possibilities. They were trying to find um, or um, identify places where they could uh, build up some sort of a shelter, but there was really no um, urgency. And that of course has also been highlighted by the previous speakers that in a way um, these different um, governments uh, were passing the back, uh, some the provincial government back to the municipality. Um, so um, over the course of the, the field work, there was some movement like um, the people in Calideras in front of these uh, detentions and as they protested because they did not want to see asylum seekers continue to uh, camp outside and, and um, at the main road. So people were sent back to central Jakarta. They stayed um, there for a while, uh, but weren't tolerated for long. And then they were sent back to an empty military compound. So there was a lot of um, short term uh, solutions, but um, yeah, no proper solution that was offered to the um, refugees. So basically to, to find uh, or to, to round up my little presentation, um, as our two case studies have shown, um, the local governments handled the challenges that were posed uh, to them by the PR quite differently. Um, and that of course had to do with the pre-existing situation that uh, some people were already the, under the IOM care. So the provision of uh, help and housing could uh, continue under this, but in Jakarta, um, there were too many uh, autonomous uh, refugees and the IOM simply would not take on new cases. So this is really a big um, problem. Um, so while Indonesia has never funded a service for refugees under its national budget, um, but rather relied on this international funding, um, the PR in a way entrenches the abdication of the state responsibility even further. So um, we think uh, what is needed are two things, and there needs to be more lobbying by the Indonesian civil society, and particularly also the Indonesian Human Rights Commission, to push for more provisions of rights to refugees. And also, as Budi has already highlighted, we think uh, that the PR should be revised, um, um, not only to improve accommodation for refugees, but also to grant other more comprehensive um, rights to work and education. Thank you. Thank you, Anji. Our final speakers for this section will be Bilal and yeah. uh, Ratu. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, can you? Uh, That's good. Yes. See the, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity. So, as Rafi said before, that I will jointly uh, present this uh, paper with my colleague uh, Ratu. I will start first. And then Ratu. So our paper uh, basically discussed uh, the existence of the causal right to asylums and its connections with the uh, humanitarian uh, approach in, in Indonesia. And it's also connected with the PR 125 uh, 2016. Uh, uh, our main argument in this paper is uh, based on what we call as uh, the triangulations or or the triangulated uh, approach of asylums in Indonesia. Uh, it's referred to the uh, three uh, approaches that exist together and interact. The first approach is the right-based approach. It's based on the existence of the process right to asylums in the constitutions and also in the human rights law 1999. And the second approach, the humanitarian approach, 
it's referred to the, the government uh, approach and allowing the refugee come to Indonesia, but uh, as a practice of the humanitarian approach, uh, not uh, as an obligation uh, by law. And the third immigration is uh, the third is immigration control approach that is uh, based on the immigration law, uh, law number six, 2011 that uh, many uh, observers uh, observe that uh, this approach tends to treat asylum seekers and refugee uh, as uh, illegal or irregular, irregular migrants, especially for those who do not have uh, valid documents. So we argue that uh, this uh, approach uh, interact together that, but uh, resulted the, 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 uh, the champions of the humanitarian and immigration control approach, but has weakened the, the value of the causes and rights to asylum. So, and the VR, uh, we observed that uh, it's not shifted the humanitarian traditions uh, in Indonesian law toward the, the refugee. Uh, and then our uh, paper started by exploring the right to asylum in, in international law. Uh, as this is uh, the main reference of the drafter uh, when uh, they are uh, drafted the uh, right to asylums in the constitutions and the uh, foreign uh, human rights law. Uh, in Article 14, there are uh, there is a guarantee of this law, right to sex and enjoy asylum. To aspect in this law, in this uh, article, uh, in the field of right to seek an asylum and the sovereign right of the state to gain asylum. And the causing right to asylum in Indonesia mirror this language is also uh, reflect the right to obtain political asylum that will be interpreted as like uh, right to enjoy asylum, but uh, it's a refer impliedly to the sovereign right of the states, even though it's not uh, referred to subjective rights uh, of individual to be granted as asylum, but it. Uh, we argue that it has consequence, at least Indonesia should uh, adopt appropriate uh, determination procedures. So conduct their own uh, determination process and give the access to rights uh, to those who are giving asylums. We also explore the significance of the Pancasila, but uh, we found that uh, this value, especially the second principle, the humanity principle, it's not giving the clear guide to the cause and right to asylum, whether it should be interpreted uh, as a humanitarian approach or the uh, right-based approach uh, protections. And then we also uh, explore uh, why uh, the cause and right to asylum is not been utilized uh, in, in Indonesia or with, by doing comparison with some states and found that there's a problem with because there is no uh, implementing law uh, to uh, make concrete uh, this causes uh, to asylum, uh, this problem is contribute to uh, uh, why this uh, right is not uh, utilized uh, in Indonesia's law right now. Uh, our paper also uh, identifies uh, some issue in the lawmaking process in the drafting uh, bill of the human rights law. 1999s and the constitutional amendment process. Uh, okay. and, and, and that um, uh, making process, we found that uh, the debates uh, focus on the uh, context of innocent citizens uh, seeking asylum in, in other countries, but uh, they are not uh, discussed about uh, the, the foreign refugee come to Indonesia. So, and uh, in uh, the amendment process, we also uh, found that uh, the, the drafter did not explore uh, the consequence when they inserting the right to asylum and the constitutions. When we argue that, I think because the amendment process is like a process of the authoritarian uh, regime, they are too reactionary to uh, give the protections based on the people's voice, but sometimes uh, did not explore uh, deeply uh, by detail uh, the, but the, the article that they are, uh, you know, uh, inserting that in the constitutions. So the next slide will be presented by Ratu, please. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, in this part, I will discuss about what dominates the PR under the triangulation approach. We argue that uh, the PR is dominated by humanitarian approach. Uh, this can be seen from the asylum procedure that is allocated to the UNHCR instead of the state. It shows that the state is being permissive to the limitation of UNHCR. Seems like a state sees it as a mere of humanitarian assistance that can be entrusted to a foreign body, in this case, is the UNHCR itself. And the second one is a very limited access to rights. Uh, refugees under the PR are uh, seen more as like a, a recipient of basic needs instead of right holders. They do not have the right to education, they do not have the right to work. And the fact that even at the extent to which uh, the states are are capable to fulfill this right has not been truly explored, which shows that these issues has not been seen as a mere of constitutional right issues. And this is contrary to the constitutional obligations of the state under the constitutions. And second of all is the dominance of immigration control approach. The problem of the immigration law that they are not being adjusted to the needs to seize refugees, uh, to giving special protections to refugees and asylum seekers. And the implications is that under, in, in practice, uh, the immigration official is heavily relied on the immigration law itself. And the second of all is the immigration control approach under the PR. Uh, they do not, uh, the PR does not giving the exact limitations of how long uh, refugees will, can be transferred to the shelters from the detentions. And also they need to report to immigration officials every month. And also there was no obligations for immigration officials and police to ensure that refugees remain in the shelters, which shows that refugees are seen as subject of immigration security. And to conclude, uh, we conclude that under this triangulation approach, that the constitutional right to asylum in Indonesia is undervalued due to a combination of legal and social political factors. And the enactment of PR has just further confirmed that the approach of Indonesia towards asylum has always been immigration and humanitarian approach, which therefore failed to fundamentally shift the structure of refugee law based on constitutional right to asylum under the constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Ratu. It was very comprehensive. Um, we now have come to the uh, third and final part, which is the commentary. Um, I now call on Max to have his presentation. Can you see my, my slides there? Yeah. It's working. Great. Okay. So um, I've been asked to speak about the politics of refugee protection in Indonesia. Um, uh, so what are the politics of, of refugee protection um, in Indonesia? It's perhaps more a difficult question than it seems. Um, so a good place to start might be to identify what refugee politics are not in Indonesia. Um, unlike in Australia, we've never seen asylum policy or even immigration feature as a national, um, you know, a national electoral issue. Um, Australia's pol uh, asylum policies, particularly its use of immigration detention, um, whether at Villa Wood in the Pacific or indeed here in um, city hotels in Melbourne, um, has long been a hot and contentious issue. In Malaysia, where there are roughly 10 times the number of asylum seekers and refugees that are present in Indonesia, we've seen the coronavirus pandemic uh, make mass raids and arbitrary detention of foreigners including refugees, commonplace. Um, Malaysia's government has gone from being one that was a staunch defender of Muslim Rohingyas um, to condemning them for supposedly taking advantage of Malaysia's hospitality. Similar outbursts of xenophobia amid the pandemic in Thailand um, after COVID clusters amongst uh, Myanmar uh, migrant workers also highlight that migration and by extension refugee protection um, are on the national political agenda. Um, and this is certainly not the case in Indonesia. Um, so it's probably worth speaking a little bit about uh, Indonesian um, attitudes to, to refugee protection. Um, in my experience, very few Indonesians even know that refugees and asylum seekers are present in their country. Um, the literal uh, translation of uh, refugee pungsi has the usual kind of of a person internally displaced by a natural disaster. Uh, this is why Presidential Decree 125 of 2016 um, refers to Pungsi Dari Luar Negeri, which is sometimes awkwardly translated into English as, as foreign refugees. 
Um, so what are Indonesian attitudes then? Um, in, in 2016, Amnesty International um, conducted a study known what they call the Refugees Welcome Index, in which it ranked 27 countries um, based upon how willing people were to take refugees into their home, uh, their neighbourhood, their town or their country. Um, and somewhat surprisingly for me, um, Indonesians were second to only Russians in sort of being the least welcoming um, to refugees, according to the survey data. Um, Thailand and Poland, where um, nativist anti-refugee and migrant sentiment are rife, uh, were close behind Indonesia there. Um, so just 1% of Indonesians surveyed said that they would actually accept refugees uh, fleeing war or persecution into their home. Um, compared to 13% in Australia and 29% in the UK. Um, interestingly, though, um, some 70% of Indonesians um, said that they thought the national government should do more uh, to help refugees fleeing war or persecution. And so, indeed, um, a national level survey um, probably obscures a, a more complex uh, situation. Um, as recent scholarship on refugees in Indonesia has shown, um, and as some of the uh, speakers before me have, have talked about, um, the experiences of refugees di differ significantly um, in different parts of the archipelago. Um, you know, the warm, albeit temporary, uh, hospitality shown to Rohingya refugees in Aceh uh, presents a significantly different picture to, to what's shown in this, in this amnesty survey. Um, Mich Michbach and Ari Putra have, have, um, and Prabhandari in previous work um, have asked if Makassar yeah, can be considered a, a sanctuary city given its histori historically welcoming um, nature for refugees. And our colleague Heru Susetio would argue that urban refugees um, have, have been quite successful in integrating in, in the Medan. Um, so indeed, um, when we look at attitudes, I think knowledge and concern of refugee issues in Indonesia um, has been described by some of my research informants as, as an elite issue. Um, this perhaps reflected by the fact that Indonesia's most prestigious universities, including um, Universitas Indonesia and Universitas Gajamada, um, have run social programs and, and research projects with refugees. Um, moreover, those inclined to attend um, documentary screenings or book launches or other cultural events um, including an exhibition of refugee art hosted at Indonesia's National Gallery in 2018. Um, people like this are typically of a particular uh, level of education and socioeconomic status. Um, interesting for me, James Riardi, one of um, Indonesia's most well-known billionaires um, as deputy chairman of the, the LIPO group, has taken considerable interest in, in refugee welfare. Um, he made a, a series of high profile visits to Kalideras, um, as um, Anju was speaking about in her presentation, um, with sort of glowing coverage in the media outlets that he owns um, of his promises to provide um, free education to refugee children. He said at the time, someday these will, these, uh, they will definitely leave. These 14,000 refugees could become good ambassadors for Indonesia if we just show them love. Um, and this to me is reflective of a pervasive view in Indonesia, um, except perhaps amongst the most ambitious refugee advocates, um, that refugees and asylum seekers are in transit um, temporarily in Indonesia and will never settle permanently. But this attitude is increasingly at odds with reality. Um, in, in late 2017, the UNHCR began a public awareness campaign um, focused on asylum seekers and refugees um, encouraging them to learn Bahasa Indonesia, to volunteer and to enrol their children in local schools um, because, quote, most refugees in Indonesia will not be able to benefit from resettlement. And so subsequently, there has been a greater push for refugees to access basic rights, um, such as those to education and livelihoods. Um, civil society advocates that I was working to are increasingly optimistic that something resembling work rights um, may become a reality. Um, however, uh, the controversial omnibus law um, passed by the House of Representatives in October 2020 has been met with resistance from um, a broad coalition of civil society groups, uh, not least trade unions. 
Um, and this, this law is supposed to have streamlined um, industrial relations and made it easier for, for companies to hire foreign workers um, and thus attract foreign investment. Um, so in such a tense political environment around um, discussions of the labour market, um, sympathy for refugees working for Indonesian employers um, is likely to be in short supply. Um, perhaps like much Indonesian policy making though, the politics of refugee protection um, seems to me to be largely reactive. Um, as Nebo and Misbach and Jones note in their introduction chapter, um, the impetus for, for, the, for the PR um, was the Andaman Sea crisis. Um, and so they attribute a lack of implementation of the constitutional right to asylum um, post 2000 um, to the relationship with Australia and, and refugee politics here. Um, I would also suggest that a lack of fulfillment um, of constitutional asylum is largely in line with Indonesia's um, overall democratic stagnation and failure in the most part to live up to liberal, liberal, liberal democratic ideals enshrined in its constitution um, and, and other laws. Returning to the regional comparison though, um, one similarity Indonesia has with Malaysia and Thailand is its reluctance to ratify the, the refugee convention. Nevertheless, as Nibone, um, Misbach and Jones detail, unlike these neighbours, Indonesia does have laws specific, specifically pertaining to, to refugees. Um, moreover, at the Global Refugee Forum in late 2019, uh, Indonesia committed to designing what it called an empowerment, uh, refugee empowerment program, um, which its delegates said at the time had the full support of the House of Representatives. Um, so these are causes for optimism. Um, unlike in Thailand and Malaysia, advocates can leverage these legal provisions and diplomatic uh, commitments in their push for furthering um, refugee protection in Indonesia. Um, given the challenges uh, outlined though, um, not least because of resistance to foreign workers in light of the omnibus law, um, the success of these efforts remains to be seen. Um, and just to conclude, um, as Godwin Gill wrote in 2008, um, it's unrealistic to imagine that the problem of refugees can ever be entirely non-political. Nevertheless, the conception of the refugee as an unprotected person um, can indeed be separated from the politics at the moment and located in a space where the refugee in turn can be seen as an individual possessed of dignity, worth and rights. Um, I would suggest that perhaps the space refugees currently occupy in Indonesia, that is one of not being on the national political agenda, uh, is a cause for hope. Thanks. Thank you, Max. Yes. It's a very comprehensive and comparative uh, analysis uh, with Malaysia and Thailand. So I now call on um, our final speaker, um, a commentary from Dr. Nick Tan. Nick? Thanks so much. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me and um, my warm congratulations both to the authors we've heard today and to the editors for this special issue. So um, in my reflections to round out the seminar, I'm going to focus on four questions related to the purpose. Um, firstly, look at a bit of background, protection in Indonesia prior to the declaration. Secondly, assess very briefly the performance of the purpose in meeting its four stated objectives, drawing from the riches of the special issue that I've had the pleasure to, to read. Thirdly, consider the role of the purpose in Indonesia's broader asylum migration policy. And fourthly, assess the purpose in the context of Indonesia's response to the global compact on refugees that Max has just mentioned. And I should be, um, I should of course acknowledge that uh, my own engagement with Indonesian uh, asylum refugee law and policy in, in fact predates the purpose. The last substantive work I did in this area was in fact in sort of mid to late 2016. Uh, so, so my own view is of, a, of an Indonesia prior to the declaration. And, and the question I guess is, well, well, what difference has it made? How much development have we seen in refugee protection in the subsequent five years? Um, so let's start with background. Um, Indonesia, of course, is often just has been described as a sort of classic transit state. As we've heard, it's not a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention. It has no national asylum law. And it's sort of 
well known for the delegation of responsibility for asylum seekers and refugees to UNHCR and IOM. So prior to the Perpres writing in the International Journal of Refugee Law, I found that um, although the presidential declaration was unlikely to provide durable solutions, it may represent a commitment to the international refugee regime and would for the first time articulate the status of asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia. So the question is, well, what has changed five years on and what has the purpose changed, if anything? So let's move then to the performance of the declaration. It has four stated objectives. The first, rescuing refugees in the humanitarian situation. Secondly, providing shelter and basic needs for refugees in need. Thirdly, protection and monitoring. And fourthly, coordination with the international organization with a mandate to handle refugees, UNHCR. So if we move then to search and rescue, I think what we see from the special issue is that perhaps the raison d'etre of the purpose was this direct response to the 2015 Rohingya crisis. Now, of course, it's worth noting that the declaration had, had a draft life uh, before the crisis in 2015. Uh, it seems there was a sort of filtering or watering down of objectives over time, but there's no doubt that in its passage, in December 2016, the 2015 crisis was the backdrop. And of course, Article 9 of the Purple endorses the lead role of Basanas in search and rescue operations. The Purple further endorsed search and rescue provisions uh, that were consistent or are consistent with Indonesia's non refoulement obligations. Um, some authors have said that, in fact, there has essentially been a sort of lost opportunity because the purpose failed to entrench search and rescue methods um, in its implementation. On the other hand, and perhaps more optimistically, one could say that since the passage of the purpose, I would say Indonesia has shown significantly more commitment to search and rescue than its neighbors, Malaysia and Thailand, as Max has touched upon. So we can assess the search and rescue element of the purpose as at least a partial success, I would say. The establishment of a framework for a search and rescue method and the identification of the relevant agency and some level of implementation. Secondly, this question of providing shelter and basic needs for refugees in need. Uh, this, uh, as far as I can assess, has not really been operationalized by the Indonesian state. Instead, uh, as sort of in the old days, Accommodation and services are provided by IOM, heavily funded by Australia, of course, and on the protection side, UNHCR programs. So there is perhaps a lack of implementation of this second element of the purpose when we think of um, the Indonesian state, cities and municipalities providing shelter and basic needs for refugees. Thirdly, of course, protection and monitoring, as we know, Prior to the passage of the Perpres, asylum seekers and refugees only had a status as a matter of international law. Post the, the Perpres, asylum seekers do receive temporary protection from UNHCR while their application is being processed and gain refugee status if successful. Nevertheless, the Perpres does not implement a domestic legal mechanism as we've heard, and as you can see, the special issue. So in this sense, if we think about Indonesia providing a level of protection to refugees, the purpose has clearly fallen short. It does not offer the legal certainty that some scholars hoped for at the outset. And fourthly, uh, in terms of coordination with UNHCR, this final aim seems to essentially formalize existing uh, relationships between UNHCR uh, and in the Indonesian state on the other hand, and so it doesn't seem particularly new for as, as soon as, as far as I can assess. So we can see that the purpose has had a sort of patchy uh, work in progress performance with some cause for optimism and some lack of implementation due to resourcing needs or perhaps simply lack of uptake. Thirdly, of course, the red thread running through the special issue is the dual sided or two faced approach to refugee protection in Indonesia and this question of how the purpose fits into Indonesia's broader asylum and refugee policy. On the one hand, of course, we have this promise of a rights-based rule of law approach to refugee protection 
in accordance with Indonesia's constitutional, national and international obligations with respect to human rights. And secondly, we have this rather stronger discretionary, exceptional or humanitarian approach drawing on a securitized notion of immigration rather than refugee law. And of course, this red thread or sort of constant tension is incredibly useful to understand the current state of play of Indonesian refugee law and policy. I wonder whether though it would be time to move beyond this dichotomy and look at further research questions relating to either strengthening the rights-based approach or equally somehow buttressing the humanitarian approach through human rights from below, or of course the development of a third alternative approach. And secondly, of course, when considering the purpose in the context of Indonesia's broader asylum refugee policy, um, it's important to note that the special issue makes some, um, some really useful contributions extending Indonesia's international obligations beyond its non-party status to the Refugee Convention. So here we haven't heard today from uh, Deal Herdi Wan Tulbing, but his article on this in this special issue entitled Connecting the Obligation Gap, Indonesia's non lawful moral responsibility beyond the Refugee Convention, I can only recommend to you. The article provides a legal overview of Indonesia's non lawful moral obligations flowing from not refugee law, but international human rights law. And it essentially argues against the government position that Indonesia does not have legal obligations to refugees simply because it's not a party to the Refugee Convention. In my view, the article convincingly argues that Indonesia's non for more obligations, that is its obligations not to forcibly return a person to a real risk of serious harm, goes beyond the Convention on Refugees to obligations under the Convention Against Torture, the ICCPR, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And crucially also, the article touches on the extraterritorial scope of these obligations. That is that Indonesia is bound by non of more, even when operating beyond its border. And finally, of course, the special issue is valuable in embedding the purpose in the context of Indonesian broader constitutional and immigration law. And as the editors conclude in the introduction, the tension between the rights-based definition in the purpose and the securitized immigration framing of the refugee problem, this tension, and I quote, epitomizes the Indonesian approach to refugee and issues under which national state responsibility is deflected on the one hand to international organizations and local governments, while on the other hand, refugees are seen as the object of state or administrative discretion. Thirdly, I'd like to, in my time, move to the question of um, the purpose in the context of the global refugee uh, scene and specifically the global compact on refugees. As you probably know, the global compact on refugees is a global responsibility sharing effort focusing or with the objective of on providing more equitable responsibility sharing for refugees. The GCR has four overarching objectives. Firstly, easing pressure on host countries. Secondly, enhancing refugee self-reliance. Thirdly, expanding access to third country solutions. And finally, supporting conditions for return in countries of origin. Now, it's important to note that the GCR is of course a non-binding international instrument. It is not a multilateral treaty. Uh, it was passed by the United Nations General Assembly in December of 2018. And of course, as Max has mentioned, the Global Refugee Forum in 2019, uh, December of that year, just before the pandemic hit, brought a whole uh, series of political commitments from both states and other actors in Geneva. And I've had a look, of course, at Indonesia's pledges or pledges related to Indonesia. Again, it's worth noting that these are not binding pledges. These are simply political declarations that may result in some form of political accountability down the line. Um, and Indonesia's uh, Indonesia's pledges on the, at the GRF, the Global Refugee Forum, focus primarily on what we would call refugee self-reliance. So as Max has mentioned, Indonesia pledged, and I quote, to design a program that will harness refugee productivity for their own benefit. And refugees will be receiving compensation to help them to sustain themselves while staying in Indonesia and using their skills 
to start a new life in resettlement countries. So this is a fascinating pledge, and of course, we'll see whether it comes to fruition. But it shows both a focus on refugee self-reliance, refugee entrepreneurship. It promises a level of compensation or it seems some sort of livelihood. And it has a dual focus on providing at least some form of temporary protection, but with the eventual aim of resettlement in a third country, which of course we've heard many times before from the Indonesian state. Indonesian pledges also related to access to education for refugee children. This is of course is a good thing, but one wonders why it wasn't in the original purpose. And another um, a pledge related to effective implementation of the purpose itself. It's not really clear what the content of this pledge is, but it seems to acknowledge that there is a significant amount of work to do on the implementation side. So to move beyond the Indonesia context specifically and talk a little bit about solutions for refugees under the GCR, um, of course, we all understand that there are three recognised uh, internationally durable solutions, resettlement, local integration and voluntary repatriation. We learn from the purpose and the special issue that only resettlement and voluntary repatriation are on the table in Indonesia. Uh, it's worth noting, no, noting that while resettlement has in the past been a real solution for refugees in Indonesia, resettlement spots globally plummeted to just 22,000 in 2020. It's an increasingly narrow and crowded uh, opportunity to in fact gain protection, as we've heard. And of course, in Indonesia, voluntary returns are not directly protected by the key principle of non reformal Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that um, UNHCR, at least informally, has considered uh, two additional solutions, not as durable solutions, but as sort of quasi solutions or sustainable solutions where the three others are not available. And, and this is reflected in the GCR. The first, of course, are complementary pathways. There's a very significant focus in the Global Compact on so-called complementary pathways to admission and lawful stay. These are forms of pathways for legal migration, for example, uh, to access uh, employment migration in a third country, to access university or a tertiary education. Um, and the point here, of course, is that rather than providing a permanent and durable solution for refugees, refugees receive a temporary and lawful solution. So the question in my mind is, well, could asylum seekers and refugees, in fact, in Indonesia, convert their status to tertiary study or labour migration? And this actually is an emerging focus in other Asian states, including Southeast Asia. Um, and the second so-called solution light is a, a form of local settlement, not integration per se, with the full set of rights provided in the 1951 convention, but a quasi integration in non-party states. And here the question is, well, can Indonesia emerge as a sort of integration light temporary protection country. And I think we see that from the role of some cities and regions, we are in fact seeing a sub-national temporary protection regime emerging. In my last uh, 30 seconds, two concluding reflections. The first is the core of the question. Has the purpose in fact improved the protection of refugees in Indonesia? And we can see at the formal level, it has started to fill some of the major gaps. Gaps remain in both in terms of rights and the implementation but an optimist would say is a step along the way to an Indonesian form of temporary patchwork refugee protection. And finally, on the research side, there is of course need for more, for, for a comprehensive comparative research agenda in this area. How do non-party states, the Refugee Convention, interact with international refugee law and protect refugees? And here, of course, Melissa Phillips and Anshuk Misbach's work is relevant, as is Maya Yanmia. What can we learn from the Jordan Compact? What can we learn from Turkey's temporary protection regime? Thanks for having me. Congratulations to the authors and to the editors on the special issue. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think we now have come to the um, portion where um, you know we, we can have an open discussion. And um, if you have any questions, so please do write them down in the Q&A uh section there is a button um 
think at the bottom of your screen and you can write your question there so we can pass them on to our panelists. So I know that there are a few questions pouring in now, so I think I should be um, reading them. It's a question from uh, Siko uh, from Suwaka, and this is for Budi. Do you want me to read Budi or have you have you got the yes. questions there? Yes, I have read okay. the questions. Regarding yes, the Siko. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for Refi and also for uh, Zico. I read the questions you addressed regarding the low hole and you asking specifically uh, what is our, uh, I mean, uh, our opinion, would it be better that the PR, the presidential regulation to be upgraded to a more strict procedural regulations? Well, uh, um, what we found in the ground and also what we observed so far uh, at the at the local level, yeah, uh, the hesitance by the local apparatus may be raised because there is no technical guidance, for example, yeah, and also there is no uh, specific guidelines, yeah, for them to take mis uh, to adopt measure or to take action on a specific issues or technical issues with regards to the refugees handling so um for yes of course we uh we agree on your uh on your idea that the pr should be upgraded to a more a strict procedural regulations yeah um what is my uh, i mean what is our argument in this paper is that we need a more uh implementing regulations. So the implementing local regulations should be very specific. At the municipality or regency level, besides the, we call that a peraturan daerah, peraturan daerah is the local regulations, is a jointly adopted by the, the local parliament, jointly with the head of regency or the mayor of the city. But once uh, it is adopted, it can be continued or further implemented with what so called as, for example, Peraturan Bupati or Peraturan Wali Kota. So the Munich, uh, the Regen, uh, in Dutch, yeah, Mr. Bila, Regen, yeah, I mean, the, the head of regency regulations or the regulations of the mayor of the city. So, and yeah, it will be better. Yeah, for example, for the strict procedural regulation at the local level, but also at the national level. Um, so far, we found that uh, the this is actually the good progress from the Minister for uh, Domestic Affairs. In, in other English terms, it can be a Minister of Home Affairs. Yeah, it is the translation of um, Kementerian Dalam Negeri. Yeah, because the local government in Indonesia, yeah, in terms of the the national institution, it is uh, coordinated under the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs. And we found uh, there are some circulars yeah, with regards to the implementations of, uh, of the handling of refugees yeah, uh, to the local government issued by this uh, ministry. So thank you very much, Revi. Thank you very much also, Sik. Thank you. Um... Is anyone would like to add more on that uh, before I move on to the next uh, question? No, okay, so I shall read the, um, the next question is from Eri Hakiki. Um, he's got one question, but in three parts. And this is uh, perhaps, you know, from, from any panelists who would like to um, answer. Um, the question. The first question is, how do you see the importance of promotion of refugee protection to the local community, that is Indonesian citizens, would give impact to the acceptance of the refugees in Indonesia? That's the first question. And the second question is, do you think it will catch the attention of politicians to amend the PR? And the third question is, what do you think the most effective way to promote it? That's from Eri. So I think on this question, any panelists can pop in. So particularly our Indonesian panelists, because these are questions really about the um, attitudes of the Indonesian people. 
and the politicians. So Dika, perhaps you'd like to respond? Sure. Um, I think this is a really good question and it really depends on the context in which community we're talking about. In some areas, for example, in Tanjung Pinang or um, in Batam, there's actually real attempts uh, from the IDC or from the immigration office to, to kind of limit um, the interactions between refugees and local communities. So rather than um, promoting the presence or promoting an understanding of why refugees are present, there, there is an attempt to hide the presence of refugees in order to, what, to um, avoid what, what uh, officials, many officials call a social conflict. So, so, so I think there are areas where it's a bit more sensitive, even in, for example, um, Chisarua, where there is kind of a mushrooming of autonomous refugees and, and locals do see their, their presence because you know, they're obviously there. Um, in, in areas like this where, where promotion would really, ben would really benefit the refugees, in my opinion, because for example, right now, Chisarua is known to be um, an area where a lot of um, Arab tourists comes in. And so there's a lot of juxtaposition between which is a tourist and which is a refugee. And, and this creates a lot of confusion. Um, so I think promotion would benefit here, but there's also hesitation I, um, from organizations working on the ground to, to, to take the initiative to do so in fear that it might cause backlash, that, that actually highlighting the presence of refugees might, might you know, proactively might create rejection. So, so, um, so it's it's a bit of a tricky question. Where, and and I think it should also be mentioned, like there is a very different um, person that comes to mind I, in in most Indonesians um, when they distinguish between how they imagine a Rohingya refugee, which is what you know the 2015 media kind of focuses on. And for example, a Hazara refugee, which is the majority of refugees in Indonesia. And, and this brings up different conversations of who deserves actual help between these different types uh, of refugees. So, so there's, there's different colors to that question. I hope that answers it. Thanks for that, Dika. Is there any, anyone would like to add to uh, Dika's uh, comment? Okay, there's none. Uh, Max, Angie, would you like to... Uh respond to uh, the second question of Zico uh, from Suwaka. Sure. Can you see that in the Q&A? I can have a go. So it's a question about the political relationship between Indonesia and Australia and whether or not Australia could have a positive impact uh, uh, on convincing or encouraging Indonesia to, uh, to revise the PR. This is how I understand the uh, question. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not aware what's going on at the moment between Indonesia, but I think I would be rather skeptical to assume that uh, Australia was in a very good position to tell Indonesia uh, how, on how to treat Asylum-seeking refugees in a better way. And, and I would also be very skeptical to think that Indonesia would be very keen to receive um, too much pressure from Australia in this regard. Um, and we are aware of this because uh, Max has already pointed out um, that, um, the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees by Australia, either in Australia or in the region, hasn't been particularly great, um, to put it mildly. And I, I don't think that would provide Australia with a lot of leverage to to um, encourage Indonesia to grant more rights. Um, but yeah, I'm, I would be very keen to hear what uh, Max has to say on this, and he might have uh, different insights on that uh, relationship and what's being discussed about these days. Uh, no, to be honest, I'd probably echo much what what you said, Anja. Um, yeah, it's it's really difficult to know. Um, uh, I mean, you know, you might you might look at say a country like Papua New Guinea. Um, the fact that I suppose Australia is sort of funding, um, you know, the the presence of of asylum seekers and refugees um, now in Port Moresby, but it's it's quite a it's quite a small number of people. Um, yeah, in terms of, I mean, I, I don't really see this as something that Australia would be particularly interested necessarily in, in you know, obviously the, the relationship is quite fraught at times. Um, and, you know, you, you would have to think that Australia wouldn't be particularly interested in, in losing any of its diplomatic or political capital um, advocating uh, on an issue that, you know, Indonesia could, could easily say, well, you know, you, you don't treat 
um, asylum seekers as well. So, yeah, I mean, without being party to to the diplomatic discussions around around that, um, it, it's really difficult to know. But um, you, you you mentioned that there is that that part of it was um, that it sorry that Indonesia is a holding area due to Australia's support for the IOM. I'm not exactly sure of that causal relationship necessarily. And what I would say um, is that even though, um, as some of our panelists have discussed, since 2014, Australia hasn't been accepting, um, you know, virtually anyone, um, oh, you know, there are some people still trickling through, but essentially if you weren't registered with UNHCR prior to mid 2014, you'd never be resettled. Um, the, the, the number of asylum seekers and refugees in, in Indonesia has remained fairly stable, even as people are resettled. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not really convinced necessarily of like uh, uh, the fact that, you know, people are going to Indonesia because they think they might get some support by the IOM. Equally, um, I mean, I think that's an interesting question in itself. Why, why are people still sort of coming? Um, but I'm, yeah, wary of, I guess, ideas around necessarily like all factors because, um, as is often noted, um, the Philippines is a um, refugee convention signatory country and, and people would have the right to work, et cetera, um, yet people don't seem to end up there. So, um, yeah, I don't know, I've probably just launched a couple more questions than I have answered, but but I think I would just, yeah, echo what, what Anja just said there. Thank you, Max. Um, is there any more question from our guests? Uh, that you would like to um, put on the Q&A section for our panelists? Um, or if there isn't, um, would any panelists would like to add for those questions that have Eri Hakiki has uh, put in? If there's any more, would you like to add? Rafi, I actually have something to add. Sure. Yes. So uh, I have a comment to the first question from Zico about the need for a more a strict procedural regulations. Uh, I think that we think from the constitutional right best perspective, we need to go beyond the need for a more procedural regulations, more implementing regulations. Yes, implementing regulations is indeed a very important and necessary, but for the constitutional best perspective, uh, we think that there is a need for the regulations itself to directly respond to the constitutions, for instance, uh, use a high regulations like laws undang -undang, or acts instead of uh, relying on procedural regulations like back press for instance that's all thank you <laughs> thank you ratu anyone else would like to add or any more questions from our uh, attendees and guests uh Rafi, maybe i can uh respond a little bit to any questions fantastic uh, thanks Bilal. yeah I think uh, uh, well, I think the the evidence from Aceh uh, that the the local community rescue the refugee is is shown as a big, uh, good very best example of how the humanitarian response based on their own uh, I don't know indigenous value can also promote the the refugee protections in Indonesia to the local community so. Uh, although we, we see that uh, Pancasila argument is sometimes abuses to more a discretionary approach to refugee, I think if we promote uh, Pancasila uh, value uh, to reinterpret it as a basis of uh, an obligations of Indonesia, I think it will be better uh, to, to promote uh, for refugee protections. Uh, instead of uh, taking directly, uh, promote refugee pro pro uh, protection from uh, the strong human rights based uh, perspective because I think uh, Indonesian people is more uh, accept the Pancasila uh, values uh, rather than the sometimes the, they, they perceive humanitarian uh, human rights uh, uh, protection based as the Western uh, approach to, to Indonesian citizens. So, but further, we can also uh, suggest to governments to uh, adapt the, the framework to determine or uh, adapt the refugee determination procedure based on the constitutions and the constitutions based on the uh, Pancasila, Pancasila value. I think, I think this 
we think the best uh, acceptable ways to promote uh, refugee protection to the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal. Before we uh, finish, um, I, I would like to uh, call on again um, uh, Professor Susan Kneebone to provide with a few final words to conclude our event today. Susan. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for excellent chairing. Thank you to everyone who's participated today, including all our authors. And I do apologize for any authors who were not included today for reasons of time. And they include Dr. Eni Soropraptor, who wrote a very interesting foreword, and also Andre Damaledo, who wrote a fascinating piece about Kupan and refugee protection. And of course, uh, Nick has referred, Dr. Tan has referred to um, Tobin's paper, which was an excellent uh, discussion of the of the uh, principles from international law. Um, but before I go on, I should acknowledge also my co-investigators under this project, uh, Anche Mista, Professor, now Professor, congratulations Anche, since we started this project, and Dr. Susetio, who is um, continuing to work in Indonesia with, uh, with in fact Max and uh, Balawin Jones uh, and on that note I'd like to particularly thank Balawin and Raby who helped to edit this special edition. Uh, we worked very very hard on it and, and I relied on those two enormously. I'd also like to thank our anonymous ref, uh, comment, comment, um, reviewers <laughs> who we selected but they did an excellent job. Um, I would of course like to thank Silas for hosting this occasion uh, in particular Tim, Catherine and Debbie uh, and I hope I haven't left anyone out. Oh yes I have, yes I would like to also acknowledge the fantastic work of Max and Jarrett Dimas on the workshop from which this whole uh, publication arose. But I'd also like to remind people that this is a publication about law and policy and politics and so forth, that whilst refugee voices have not been directly represented in this publication, they all our writing and all our efforts are in fact directed towards that. But we are working under an ARC project with specific objectives, and they unfortunately do not include um, uh, direct uh, representations of refugee voices, but we do try to represent them when, whenever, we, whenever we can. So apologies if I have forgotten anyone, and apologies again for my unprofessional handling of my slide at the beginning, uh, but thank you all, particularly those who've risen early in the morning uh, in cold places, uh, whilst we in virtually COVID-free Melbourne are enjoying crisp, sunny autumn weather, um, and I hope to see you all in person someday soon. And again, Ravi, thank you for excellent chairing. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.